and welcome once again to another episode of Real. I'm your host, Kalani Fisher. Now, unfortunately, we're nearing the end of our journey as this is our second last episode of Series 2. On tonight's program, we will explore isolation through love and loss in the community. American academic Keith Henson once said, people can undergo a sudden change of thinking and loyalties under threat of death or intense social pressure and isolation from friends and family. I think that quote sums up perfectly how isolation can take hold of someone's life and not let go. Now our first film tonight explores isolation through a little girl in need of a friend and believe me, it has quite an interesting twist. Annie and Henry is directed by Jolliver Janssen. Let's take a look. What you want from me, what you want from me, what you want from me I see the way you look at me I just need a friend I just need a little missy. I'm Annie and I'm having a wonderful day. Even though I cut my pinky with scissors this morning. Nice smile. Doesn't it hurt though? No, not anymore. The smile takes care of the pain and brings me happiness instead. Awesome. Well, it's been nice to meet you Annie. I have to go now. Maybe we'll see each other again tomorrow. Hey Annie, what you reading? Something interesting? I'm just holding the book, not actually reading. Mum says stay in the neighbour, tells her if I've been reading or not, but I guess you can't tell if I'm reading or just holding it. Where are, where are your parents? Are they working? Yeah, they're always working. Sometimes they don't get to see them all day. Fancy a drink? Thanks Annie, I'd love one. Hey Annie, would you like to come to my house? I've got something awesome to show you. It's not far from here, it's just around the corner. What is it? No, don't tell me. I love surprises. Let's go. She's pretty fat though, isn't she? Yeah. You should name them. I've met a new friend today. Yes. His name's Henry. We do all sorts of stuff together. He's a man, not a boy. But still so cool. That's good. Hey Annie, something wrong or are you just tired? Both. Mum and Dad have been drinking and fighting all night, so I didn't get much sleep, so you could say I'm a bit drained. 
Mm. You should definitely take a nap then. Even if it's only a power nap, it could probably save the rest of your day. Come on, show me your couch and I'll tuck you in. All right, don't go anywhere. We'll be back after the break. Welcome back. Now we just watched Annie and Henry and that was a gorgeous little girl that starred in that little film, a brilliant piece directed by Jolliver Johnson. Okay, so our second film tonight is a documentary called Beauty, Rich and Rare about two siblings who choose to live a life away from the community. Now, I actually had the privilege of directing this documentary and I worked with an incredible team. Beauty, Rich and Rare is an insight into how isolation can shape a person's life away from the community. Let's take a look. Anne Margaret Kathleen Smith, and I'm 54 years of age. Um, your full name, Walter Carey Charles Smith, 73. Yeah, because it belonged to my mum and dad, and uh, now my brother and I live here. 142 acres. Uh, converted into hectares, I'm not sure because. <laughs> Dad started it off and then Mum took over when Dad went, but still that was... And then I'm on it. So I suppose Anne's supposed to, if I don't, not here, well Anne's takes over. Because of the age difference, I look up and respect him more like a father figure, I guess, as, than a brother, but he is also a brother as well. But yet he respects my ideas too, of what we talk about the farm and that, uh, because I'm a younger generation. Oh, righto. Uh, way back uh, years ago, 1952, in my father's 
had a lot of haystacks around. See, and all this got burnt down in the bushfire. The house and the sheds and all that, and it's all been replaced. Uh, I was only just uh, stopped from going to school that when that happened. Because when I left school, that was what, what my job was, helping them. I worked for them all the time. But I only worked for my food and my clothes and their bed to sleep in. That's all I got. Well, I had to go to school as well as be home until I was 15. And then when I was, the day I was 15, I left school to be home on the farm, which I was quite happy about. I guess it's on the, the father's the way he used to do things. I've had to watch him. There was the chaff cutter. Now that's something I won't forget in a hurry. Uh, the chaff cutter, I watched him feed it. One day something happened and there was a noise. Uh, this, uh, something happened about the knife anyway and the, the box that's over shielded it. And he told me, if that happened, you, you want to drop down on the ground. I did that. Sorry. And whizzes. That was the blades. Went whizzing in the air. You see? You had to be quick. Because it hit you in the head. But what happened? It broke the knives and the wheel on the cutter and threw the belt off the tractor. So. Yep. Anyway. Because of the circumstances of a very dominating mother, I didn't communicate with the outside world until the age of 28. So then I sort of had to overcome my shyness and with all the pressure at home, if I tried to bring friends home, I'd be told no. They're not allowed to be here and all this, and I was never allowed to have boyfriends or anything. That was out of the question. So you didn't worry. You just learned how to be out and go to work and not encourage people. It was easier that way. Because in the past, I've known myself to not be outside the boundary of this fence for up to two years at a time. There'd be only one outing in two years. And uh, I've grown to the farm and I find that the animals are better to talk to than the people that are out where if I go out anywhere, I sort of become lost. Chookyard. Down to the chookyard. No. We get in here. Come on, chook. Yeah, no, chook. There's a chook on the nest in there. See this one? That pen. Get the eggs out from under her. That's a buff Sussex, that hen. Quietness of the uh, birds and the animals in general, like wild animals and all that. Yeah, yeah. it's so much different to the city. Come on, Buttercup, come on. Hurry up. Buttercup. Come on, Buttercup. Milking time. Buttercup. It wasn't any good me giving them a big whack. Yeah. I just had to give her time and talk to her. These ropes, I make them myself.
the uh, tip of our milk like this. Because basically a farm is the way you can make a living. We're not people people. We're animal people. And the animals become our friends and we basically substitute them for friends. Come on, Silk, round you come. That's a way. Sure, Chuck. Come on, Silk, down here. Hey, Silk, come on, here. Silk. Come on, Silk. He comes. Here. Yeah. Yeah. And we're both planning on this as our retirement. Well, I've got all these things and uh, this is where I'm familiar with all the land and all the soils. And uh, I've got all these animal things around me, the chooks and thing and another. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm staying here till uh, whatever happens. The rails were down, the horses were ready, the riders lingered still. One had a parting word to say. One had his pipe to fill. It's <laughs> a nice call. That's what Mum used to say that. I can yodel high and I can yodel low, and that's what tricks me up with which one I should be doing. Yodel, yodel, yodel. Beautiful. <laughs> so good. How much? <laughs> nice. And that was Beauty Rich and Rare. Now, we're joined once again by Senior Lecturer of Cinema and Media Studies at La Trobe University and our regular guest, Dr Gabriel Murray. Gabriel, nice to see you on the show. Lovely to see you, Kalani, in this second last show. Yes, I know. It's a, it's a bit sad. It's it, our second last show. It is a bit sad <laughs> and um, a little bit strange in the sense that I think I might be asking the questions today. Yes, yes. you will be. I'm a bit nervous, actually. So We're you should be, now you know roles. how I feel. Yeah. <laughs> All right, far away. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I have to say, um, as somebody who works in film and, and loves film, this is sort of the opportunity that you're always waiting for, that you yes. actually are in a situation where you get to make the film, get to speak to the filmmaker and yeah. ask them, <laughs> you know, about the specifics of the production. Um, the one question that really comes to mind uh, after seeing this film is there seems to me to be a story there in the sense of how did you come across Walter and Ann Smith? How do you know these people? Um, well, basically, they are cousins of my stepmom, and we, our whole family kind of came to know about them a few years ago, and through my stepmom and my dad, I kind of got to meet them as well. And they, from the first time I met them, they were such captivating people. Um, and I think my whole family thinks that. Um, they're very lovely and, yeah, really wonderful. So can you tell us a little bit about the actual shoot? Because it yes. feels very intimate and you're obviously lucky, really, really glorious weather. So you oh, have these beautiful the images. The weather was, um, was incredible and uh, we were just so lucky to have such great weather. So basically um, my cinematographer and I, Laura Dana, we went down to Wangaratta with, with my stepmom and um, we went down there and we stayed there for a night and two days and we thought we're just going to shoot as much footage as possible, really get in there. We wanted to, we actually decided to stay on the farm so that we could wake up early, do our shooting and just really get a sense of what it was like on the farm. And I've been there before, but you know, every time you go back there, it's just as beautiful. 
just as beautiful, rich and rare as it always is. Yeah, it's a fabulous title. Mm -hmm. I have to say, um, I'm not surprised that you know Walter and Anne because there's a way in which they've really let you into their lives. So there's such an intimacy. The thing that I find astounding too, yeah. I mean, uh, I have relatives on dairy farms, etc. Yeah. but the way in which they're still using a, a generator run milk yes. milker and they've got, you know, the kind of particular contraptions that he's made to hold the hold cow's it. leg yeah. and the cup that doesn't actually disturb the chicken when mm -hmm. you're getting the eggs out yeah. and, and it's really quite amazing. I found that really interesting as well and I think we all found that interesting that, yeah. you know, there were those kind of things that they had on the farm that were like that generated milk milker yeah. and then you've got things like ropes and kind of homemade things that help Walter get around on the farm and it's so interesting to see um, when, I, when we actually interviewed him he said that he loves detecting things and he loves finding and solving problems and you can see that because he's so creative and inventive in what he does and what he can work with on the farm and it's a, it's a whole other world I never would have ever thought to make a little kind of contraption like that, a little kind of cup on a stick to collect eggs. And yet, you know, it comes so naturally to him. So, and, and with that, he said that a lot of the things he does learn gets passed down from his parents and generations and learning. So, yeah. And I guess uh, just one other yeah. thing that really strongly comes across is mm -hmm. their relationship to the land and oh, the animals is amazing. amazing. It was, oh, and it really showed. It was incredible. Um, um, thank you so much for joining us, Gabriel. Thank you, Colleen. And um, yes, thank you for putting me on the spot there. <laughs> well, um, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for tonight once again on Real. We never have enough time on this show. Thank you for joining us. And next week marks our final episode of Real for season two. So tune in at the same time next week as we explore memories through love and loss in the community. I'm your host, Kalani Fisher. Keep it real, Melbourne. <laughs>